Hey folks, Gary here with Paramount. So today is kind of a little bit of an impromptu video. Uh, this wasn't really intended. As a matter of fact, I got Summer over there working right now. She's diligently processing orders. So you may hear the phone ring or something like that, but I'm trying to get a little bit better at uh, shooting videos on the go without turning some big, huge production, which I am known for and I'm really bad at. May not be a perfect austere studio environment. You may hear some background noise, but you know, you probably don't care to begin with. Uh, but we just got into this new product and I was getting ready to mount the scope and I wanted to share this with you as well. I'm actually doing a different, I'm trying a different scope mounting technique or at least using a different piece of equipment. Um, it's pretty much the same concept, but we'll go over that in a second. But the real reason behind this video is this new MDT product, Modular Driven Technologies are on our website. This is their new one piece scope mount. Um, I've already checked out a couple of these, but I wanted to show them to you because they are pretty awesome. Just like anything else MDT makes, there's a, a few brands that we carry that genuinely always get me excited. And you know, it's, MDT is one of them. They're always producing great products. Uh, Masterpiece Arms, AccuTac, Fat Boy Tripods. I'm really super impressed with those products as well. Uh, I'm sure there's a couple more. But MDT is always making good gear, and I wanted to show you these so that you're just aware of them, because I haven't seen anybody else put a video out on this, and uh, they're, they're just excellent products. So we'll go ahead and open this up, and as we go along, I'll talk a little bit about the Short Action Custom Scope Level. I do want to give you my overall impressions of these at the end. I actually have two of these, and I didn't buy these for scope mounting. Um, I actually bought these for testing, tracking on optic. I can actually put these on an Arca Swiss tripod, have the scope mounted up there, and then we can check tracking. That's really what I, I bought these for. So more of a scope testing, but I'll, I'll show you kind of how these work a little bit. But I decided to give them a try as far as actually scope mounting, and this is mounted down. But anyways, let's get into this one piece scope mount by MDT. I wanna show you guys this. I'm not big into unboxings, but you know, it is a new product. We'll take a look at the instructions so that you don't have to. Uh, you know, every time that you look at instructions, you lose at least 40% of your testosterone. So here is the mount itself. And folks, this thing is a beast. And I am really, and again, here, here's the box. If you wanna see that, that goes right there. All right, so um, I really like the fact, and this is very reminiscent of, you know, a spur mount. And they're about 400 bucks. Again, these are on our website. So this is their medium height mount. It's a 34 millimeter, but the height on this is, I really like is 1.34. I think that is almost a perfect height for especially chassis guns. Um, I just did a video, if you haven't checked that out, how to set your gun up to you and make sure that you adjust the gun. One of the things I talk about that I run to a lot of is people are trying to get their optics low, right? And there's really no good reason for that. I talk more in depth on that video, but really what that does is it puts you in a very uncomfortable position and it has no ballistic advantage. So I think 1.34 is almost a perfect height for most scopes, especially with larger uh, objective lenses. But as far as just making sure that the gun lines up to you and you're able to mount the gun comfortably without cranking your neck way over, um, I think is a good height. So anyways, but these are very reminiscent of the spur mounts. And you can see right here on the rail bolts, it even has their number just like spur where it gives you the order to torque these down. So we have one, two, three, and four. But also look at these rings, folks. Number one, you got a lot of surface area here that's gonna hold that optic really well. They do detail a very specific way of mounting these or at least tightening down our scope ring caps that is very different than most optics. I thought that was interesting the first time I mounted an optic using one of these. And I'll tell you, uh, it's a little counterintuitive, but um, everything worked, everything functioned perfectly fine on that optic that I mounted. So what I'm gonna do right now is go ahead and remove these top caps. Uh, we're gonna throw some Vibratite on the screws, let those sit a little bit, and then we're gonna get the optic out, check everything out, get everything set up, and I'll talk about how this works, and we'll go from there. And folks, just so you know, this is a T25 Torx for the top caps. Um, which I really like. Usually what you're looking at is a T20 on these. I like the fact that they're T25. It's much less likely to uh, strip or anything like that. So we'll go ahead and remove these. So folks, with these, with these one-piece mounts, you know, they're basically milled out of one piece of aluminum. Um, so these are basically machined to match. So this top ring 
in theory, should match perfectly with this bottom piece. This ring cap came off this ring. I'm gonna make sure it goes back, and also I make sure that I maintain the same orientation. I think that's important so that these match up that much better. All right, folks, since I have this extra final scope level, I'll just show you how I'm gonna end up mounting this up. We're always gonna set this on the rail, make sure that it is mounted perfectly, make sure that the clamping portions aren't bound up in any way or anything like that. And again, what we have right here, it says number one. And you also wanna make sure that these pieces over here are flush. I pushed it out, there we go. So we wanna make sure that those are all flush, make sure that these are all mounted correctly, and then we're always gonna push this toward the front to accommodate any recoil, making sure that it doesn't move or slide the mount back. And again, I'm gonna transfer this whole thing over to here, but I just wanna show you from this perspective uh, because you're not gonna be able to see this side once I mount it onto the piece. So I'm just showing you how I'm doing it. I'm keeping tension pushed forward, which would be the orientation of the muzzle. But this is how it's gonna look. And again, we're going to end up tightening this in order. We have one, two, three, and four. And let's talk about some torque specs right here at the beginning. So it does say in the instructions to make sure that we tighten the cross bolts in order one, two, three, and four to 65 inch pounds. So the cross bolts are 65 inch pounds. We have four of those. That optic isn't going anywhere. So what's interesting on this, and I thought was, again, almost counterintuitive, was the fact that if we look on the diagram that tells us how we're going to tighten the top caps, we have one, two, three. So you're tightening down one side to 15 inch pounds before we start moving to the other side. Uh, and that's very different than most. It says there should be no gap. You know, that is definitely a much different approach than we normally take when tightening down most mounts or ring caps. So um, yeah, anyways, we'll work through that. All right, so while I'm making sure that I maintain the orientation as well as keeping track of the front and the back cap, now we're just adding a little bit of Vibratite to the fasteners. All right, so the first thing I did was make sure the short action custom final scope level was leveled front to back. And if you guys notice, we have these wheels in the bottom here, and this is what's going to change our horizontal angle, right? All right, so now that we got that level front to back, what we're gonna do is make sure that we have it level from side to side using these two wheels right here. All right, so it's not perfectly straight on, but you guys can kind of see what's going on. But again, all I'm doing is working these two wheels until I have it nice and tight and the fact that it is perfectly level. All right, so that's perfectly level. And again, I've talked about this in the past, but you know, to check your level, folks, to make sure that it's good, what we can do is we can turn that 180 degrees and make sure that we are getting the same reading. That lets you know that your level is good. And I've tested this level against much more expensive levels that I know that are good as well. So again, we're getting the same reading both ways. So we know that this thing is nice and level. Now let's open up our beautiful Night Force Attacker 5 to 25. Hey folks, sorry to interrupt, but this is Gary from the future because I forgot to say this earlier, but if you like content like this, make sure you like, subscribe, throw a comment down below, hit that bell notification so that you're notified when we make new content and release new content like this. The other thing I will tell you folks, if you're watching this on YouTube and you support and defend the Constitution, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, if all of that's important to you, I would ask you to stop watching YouTube. We're slowly moving all of our stuff over to Rumble. We're going to continue to put stuff on YouTube because that's how we're going to get people the message on YouTube and get people from YouTube over to Rumble. It's the only way that we can do it. But YouTube is an enemy of the Second Amendment. They're an enemy of the First Amendment, and they don't deserve your views. So I would you know, ask you, if, if the Second Amendment is important to you, make sure that you are staying on platforms that actually support and defend our freedom to express ourselves, our freedom to exercise constitutional rights, like when it comes to you know, two-way content like this. Also, if you haven't already, make sure you go follow us on our other social media sites. We do a lot of cool things on there. And every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, we have our live Live Dangerous Liberty podcast. We talk about guns, gear, training, politics. We have special guests on all the time. Uh, and you get to interact with us live. You get to ask questions live with the guests, with us, whatever we got going on. You get to throw your comments down there, get to interact. It's a lot of fun. So make sure you join us on Wednesday. But we really appreciate you watching this channel and your support. And I'll let you get back to the rest of the video. All right, folks, I don't know if you've ever seen inside one of these 
night force boxes. You know, this is where your optic goes, right here, obviously. Then you have this little section over here, and what is in here is two, well, three things that I think are important. Number one, your sunshade. If you bought a night force that comes with a sunshade, not all of them do, but the attackers do. The other thing that comes in that little spot right there are these two little envelopes. And as it says on there, do not discard, pretty important. Um, I'll show you what those two things are in just a second. And of course in here we have like a little lens cloth. And actually one of the most useful things I wish all optics came with is like a little multi-tool. This right here actually fits all the fasteners on the optic and it's actually very handy. I actually keep an extra one from one of mine in my fix it stick toolkit because I use that out on the range for myself and others all the time. So, but we'll, this is for the client, we'll leave that in there, but I am gonna install this piece, this piece right here, which is the throw lever for the magnification. We'll install that for them, and I'll show you what's in this other envelope as well. All right, folks, so something that's often come up in scope mounting. Now, this is something I check every single time. And I often hear when, when we're talking about scope mounting, Gary, you need to level it off the bottom. You don't need to level it off the top because the turrets aren't flat. Folks, I can tell you 95% of all the ones that I've ever mounted are indeed flat and they, they match with our scope bottom. If that is a concern of yours, and it's, it's a real concern, right? What we can do is we can find a level surface. We can put the flat portion of the turret housing on that, and then we can check the caps. And I always do that. Now I will tell you right now, this one is a little off, but here's how we fix that though. The first thing I do is I check to see that whatever surface that we're using is level, that's level, all right? And now I have something that's machined flat that I've also confirmed is level. All right, and I'm gonna put that on whatever I'm mounting it on, that's level. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to mount this or lay that there. And now I'm just gonna hold this there because it's not well balanced, right? That's not the balance point. And I can tell you, let's, let's, let's move this back to zero because I know what it's on, all right? And I can tell you on this one, this is one of the few occasions that I've seen this, but all right, we are not perfectly level right there. I don't know if you can see that. I'll try to zoom in and it's kind of at an angle so you may not be able to tell, but it's not perfectly level. So what do we do? We, we can tell that there's some cant built into the turret. Well, it's pretty easy. What I found was I just rotated this until I found a level spot. It happened to be at 3.2. And then I checked to see, confirm that. So now I know that this if I use it that setting, basically what we have is we have a parallel plane between the bottom and the top of the turret. So I'm essentially leveling off the bottom of the turret. That's something I check every time. I'll, I can tell you, especially the high-end scopes, I'll tell you 90% of the time, folks, the top and the bottom right off the bat match. I can turn it, doesn't change anything, but it is something that you need to check, something that I always check every time I mount a scope because you know, run out does happen. You know, imperfections will make their way into even the best products, period. So it's just something to be aware of, but that's how you fix that if you do run into that problem. All right, so we now have a parallel surface with uh, the bottom of our turret housing. We're good to go there. So let's talk about this real quick. I'll just go ahead and mount these up. Um, I don't like to just rip these open a, a clients. We'll get some scissors and cut that open so it looks nice and neat. All right, so I just put a slit in there, keep it neat for the client, and out pops our throw lever. We can even use our handy dandy multi-tool from Night Force. We'll just go ahead and remove that. So now that we removed that plug, we have a hole there, and we're just that's where our throw lever threads into. Folks, I just do this hand tight, put a little MA in on it. It is pretty easy to strip that little hex slot out. So again, I just do this by hand and it's never gonna come off. All right, so we got that put together. Now we have what's known as the beauty ring right here. Just show you this to you guys. We open that up. 
I really, my only complaint with Night Force is I wish they had locking turrets. They don't, all right? Um, so if you want to keep your windage knob exposed, the problem is, is that it's also exposing these threads right there. And that's what this is. So if you want to keep your windage knob available, I mean, for the most part, depending on what reticle you have, you probably don't need to dial a lot of wind. So, you know, it's definitely safer to put this on there so that it doesn't get accidentally bumped, which definitely can happen. So it's up to you. So that beauty ring is going to make it to where your turret is exposed, but you're not going to damage the threads on where the uh, actual turret cap resides. So I just want to show you that. We'll go ahead and thread our turret cap back on there. We'll put our BD ring back in its beautiful little envelope. Keep everything nice and neat. And set that off. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and mount. We're gonna mount our mount. We're gonna mount our mount. We're gonna mount our mount to this. So again, what I'm doing, especially if you're mounting this to your gun, we just wanna make sure that it's nice and firm and that we got all of these, the, all the threaded portions for our cross bolts are nice and flush in the mount. And then we can just go ahead and just get those hand tight for now. And again, this is not staying on this obviously, so I don't need to worry about torquing this down to 65 inch pounds or anything like that. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and place our optic inside the mount. Now, as you'll notice, as we place this down into the mount, we have, I don't know, probably an inch either way that we can adjust this. And I know many of you are saying right now, well, Gary, what about eye relief? It is probably a little bit better procedurally to have this on the gun, make sure you check eye relief and all those other good things. With that being said, you also have plenty of, uh, quite a bit of adjustment within the pick rail itself. So once we get this mounted, if when I send this to the client, because I don't have his gun right now, or I would take a little bit more time to get it pretty darn close, at least for me, which obviously could be different for the client. But again, most of the, most of the guns that we have today, we can adjust that length of pull, which will also allow us to adjust our eye relief. But then within the pick rail itself, we can obviously move that forward or back incrementally to the point that we're gonna find 99% of the time, you're gonna find a spot that's gonna work for you as far as eye relief, just mounting it like this. Making sure that the optic is plumb inside the mount and then being able to take this mount and put it on another gun. But folks, regardless of what methodology you ascribe to, you believe in, whether it's the flashlight method, plumb bob, this, whatever else, or even me mounting it and giving it to the client, Folks, you need to make sure that you do a tall target test. That's the only way that you can verify all the variables that we're dealing with. Regardless of how perfect your methodology is, there's always human error that's available to us. And then of course, internally, we need to make sure that it's tracking correctly, perfectly vertical, and or to make sure that the reticle is mounted and plumb within the optic itself. So the only way to make sure that all of those are correct is to shoot a tall target test. It's the only way that you're gonna verify. So regardless of what method you're using, make sure that you do some testing, make sure you shoot a tall target. That is what's gonna let you know if your scope's mounted correctly, it's built correctly, and it's functioning correctly. And that's what we're looking to do, all right? So this should be good. Again, if the client gets it, he'll be able to you know, kind of hand tighten it up on the pick rail, check his eye relief if he needs to move it forward or back. It's usually, again, we're only moving not even a quarter of an inch forward or back on these pick rails. So there should be plenty of room for error and or adjustment, right? All right, so these have been sitting over here for a couple minutes. Our uh, Vibratite is a little bit cured. We're gonna make sure that we put them back onto the optic in the same orientation and in the same order. So this is the front, this is the back. So that's good. Now we're gonna make sure that the scope itself is sitting plumb and square. So that looks perfectly square to me. All right, so now let's follow our directions. I'm losing testosterone so you don't have to. So according to this, you're going to tighten the screws that are closest to me first. And again, this is a little, a little counterintuitive to me, but we will do as the instructions say. So I'm tightening these down, there's number one. Now I'm doing number two, which is to the right of it as I'm looking at it, to your left. All right, I'm just gonna tighten that down even with that. Okay, and then we're gonna do number three as numbered on the instructions. All right, 
Now I'm gonna look at my bubble, see if we have any changes. Looks like we don't. Let me see if those, with those tightened down. All right, so we already got some tension on it. Or again, I'm gonna do number one. Probably should have done an overhead camera, huh? So this is what I'm talking about. I start turning this into a Steven Spielberg production every time. Oh, I should have done this. I should have had uh, should have had someone doing Foley in the background for sound effects. It's YouTube, Gary. It's YouTube. Nothing wrong with having high standards, right? Want to improve every time we make a video. All right. So we, we've tightened down one, two, and three on one side. Now we're going to go across here. And let's see. We start tightening down. You can see right there. Where's my camera? Right there. Four five and six so it's in this orientation yep so we're going to do four which is the middle one and i'm watching the whole time to see if i get any movement out of my bubble so far i have not folks this is one thing that i like about the vibratite too um you know i've talked about vibratite i think vibratite is a much better answer for using as a thread locker than um, Loctite. One of the things that people talk about when they're making a argument for not using any sort of thread locker, uh, and even scope manufacturers and or ring manufacturers, I have seen actually have this in their instructions or talk about this. And that is, you know, Loctite, for instance, it has a, it's kind of a high viscosity, right? It has, it has lubrication properties. So, you know, if I was to tighten this, if I was to tighten a fastener with Loctite, because it allows some lubrication, I can actually crank that down further using 15 inch pounds or whatever it is, than I would if I was not using any sort of thread locker. So you end up putting more clamping force because it's working as a lubricant. Whereas Vibratite, it actually gets gummy. It's working against you. So you're not adding additional, if anything, you might be adding a little bit less, which is probably, which is, which is definitely better, but it's still gonna hold it. It stays gummy, it doesn't fail. Loctite fails all the time. It breaks down after a while. Uh, folks, anything that you're using on a firearm, I'm telling you right now, if it's not, if it doesn't require some sort of high temperature thread locker, use Vibratite, you'll get much better results. You can reuse it. Loctite, you can't. So if you're out in the fields or you need to take something apart, you can put it back together and it's still gonna work inside those threads because it stays gummy, almost like a butyl rubber. So anyways, I digress. All right, so, so far, our bubble hasn't moved on us. And now we are going to finish this. Sometimes you will get a little bit of what I call ring pull. As you tighten down one side, it'll kind of start to cant over the other. All right, folks, so just as I was talking about, I wasn't seeing any ring pull, I started tightening down that side and I did get just a little bit. Because I, again, I still have this, both of, all of this pretty loose. So I am going to take my time, delve deep into my OCD, and make sure this is right. All right, so I probably fast forward that or just cut to this to save you the boring procedure, but I just probably spent about 10, 15 minutes, you know, making sure that was perfectly right because we were getting some ring pull. When I tightened down that far side, it was pulling it a little that way. So I had to sit there and play with it until I got in the perfect offset so that when I tightened it down, it moved directly to center. And folks, that's the thing that when you drop your optic off at a gunsmith, most of them are not gonna spend the time that I just spent making sure that that was absolutely perfect. And it's really important. Uh, so either again, have someone like me mount it that you, know, that you can trust that's gonna do it right or make sure that you do it yourself. That's why I share this openly with people. I show you how I mount an optic. Regardless of what you end up with, again, folks, you gotta shoot that tall target test to make sure that it is mounted perfectly, it is working perfectly, and it is built perfectly. That's what we need for an optic to work the way that we expect it to work, and to move the bullets and the impacts the way that we expect it to. All right, so right now I have all these T25 fasteners basically hand tight, probably three, four inch pounds tops. All right, folks, as I was sitting here editing this, I did make an observation that's probably obvious to many of you, but um, 
and, and I'm not even sure that it would make a difference, but I think it's definitely worth trying, or at least pointing out that I didn't follow the instructions perfectly. In the instructions, it does say to tighten down that one side of the mount to 15 inch pounds initially, and then to tighten down the other. Ultimately, we ended up with a optic that was perfectly square in the mount, and that's the end result is what matters. But my thought on that is maybe if I had tightened those down to 15 inch pounds all on that one side, it would prevent the ring pull. I'm not sure if that's true or not. The next time that I mount an optic using that mount, I will definitely try that and I'll give you an update on that. Or if you've already used this mount and you tighten them down 15 inch pounds all on one side before you move to the next side uh, and you didn't get any ring pull, let me know your results one way or the other. So anyways, I just wanted to point that out, clarify that, and again, I'll give you guys an update on that. But overall, I'm really impressed with these mounts. They're very heavy duty. That's what I want in an optic mount, and uh, those things are not gonna come loose. Lots of surface area, both on the rail itself as well as the optic, and that's what we're looking for. But anyways, I'll let you get back to the video. And we'll read exactly what it says in the manual here. Um, again, I'll lose the testosterone so you don't have to. It says tighten torque screws on the indicator to 15 inch pounds. But below that, it also says typical torque settings can range between 15 to 25 inch pounds. Always consult scope manufacturer specs when torquing. I'm about 99% sure, and somebody correct me down in the comments below, because um, I actually looked in the manual just to see if I was right or not. I couldn't find it. Uh, but I believe that the Night Force Attacker torque limit is 25 inch pounds. Now there's a couple other things that I consider when doing this. Number one, the size of the rings uh, and, and what we got going on here. Folks, with these massive rings and the fact that we have three fasteners on each side, I see no reason to go above 15 inch pounds. I think that's gonna hold this thing plenty firm and so that's what we're gonna to torque this down to, 15 inch pounds. Um, in this particular kit, I do have a torque limiter. That's a 15 inch pound torque limiter in the works kit. Um, and those come with the all-in-one or the torque limiters. Uh, both are handy. I'd probably say if you were gonna, if I told you to get one or the other, probably get the all-in-one. The all-in-one is just gonna give you a lot more flexibility. But since we do have the 15 inch one here, and again, I'm gonna use the same diagram. So it says to tighten this one. All right, we're there. That's number one, number two, three, four, five. And, and by the way, I'm gonna put this back up here just to make sure nothing changes. Right now we're still good. Six, one, two, three, four, five, and six. We'll just do that one more time. One, two, All right, we are still perfectly level. Everything is good to go. And that's that folks. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take this off and I'll show it to you. All right, so this is what we end up with folks. But look at this thing. It's just a uh, really, really nice piece of machined art. But folks, this is the difference. And I wanna show you what, what is so different between this scope mount and others is we end up on this side that you have two dots where you start off with, all right? And there's no gap there. But as we switch to this side, there is a gap. And you guys can see that. So that's a little different than what we normally see with a uh, typical scope mount. We're gonna return this to zero. And the other thing that I'm gonna do, I always do this with client scopes because just in case they don't, Folks, anytime you get a new scope, freaking turn these turrets, just go crazy with it. Turn them left and right, up and down, break everything loose, make sure it's good to go. And if your scope is sat for a while, make sure you're doing that. We're gonna turn that all the way up. We're gonna turn that all the way down. I know most scope manufacturers say to do that, uh, but I have seen literally looking through the optic, a brand new scope or a scope that's been sitting a while as I'm shooting. And then I just go to turn it a little bit or something like that, the, the reticle will jump dramatically. And what that is is those springs in there that are holding that erector tube kind of get seized up or something's going on in there and suddenly it will. So anyways, the point is 
make sure that you loosen these up, you turn them so you don't have that problem. That is going to track true. So we went crazy with that. Same thing with the, I do the exact same thing with the parallax. Turn that around, check that out. I'm gonna open this thing up. Make sure everything is working correctly. This is the Mill XT reticle, which I really like. I think I'll get the Mill XT probably in one of my next. And let me just see if the, uh, yep. All right, so we already got a battery installed. I love the Digiloom. We got green and red. I was just checking to make sure that both are working properly. And then it'll turn off on its own. All right, folks, so let's talk about this uh, device, using this for the first time. I like it. Um, I don't think this is for everybody. I think this is like a $200 item. I think for what I'm using it for, uh, it makes sense sometimes. Without a doubt, folks, it is best to mount the optic on the gun itself. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but I will say with most machining standards today, there is really no issue with mounting it the way that we did and then putting it on another gun. Everything should be level, should be good to go but you're not gonna know until you do that tall target test regardless. So make sure you do that. But I, I do like this. Um, and again, I don't think this is for everybody. I think even for me, if I had the actual gun here, I would even mount that on the gun itself. So we can get everything perfect from the beginning, make sure that the eye relief is as close to perfect as we can get without the actual shooter here. Uh, but there again, I think for a lot of instances, this makes a lot of sense. Um, it definitely, makes the process fairly easy and straightforward. Uh, but I think I'll make sure that I keep these around mainly for scope testing. Well, folks, I hope that was helpful. I hope that was informative. Um, I, again, I really like this MDT mount. This is a very robust, I mean, right up there with, uh, you know, a spur mount. I, I love, like you, you can, there's, there's places that you can save weight on a gun if you need to. I mean, most of the time we're adding weight to a gun, but you know, I'm not gonna go lightweight on, I'm not a big believer in these lightweight optic mounts. I, I just don't see the point. I've seen those break too often and I want as much, I wanna be able to put as little torque on that as possible while maintaining a lot of surface area so I can use the least amount of torque needed but still hold the optic well, even on a high recoiling gun. Something that's beefy like this is gonna make sure that it's gonna hold that mount onto the gun itself, as well as hold the optic within the rings. And surface area is what you need, and that has a lot of surface area, and that's that's what's nice about it. So I think it's right up there with any of the spur mounts or any of the uh, MPA mounts. All right, folks, well, I hope that was helpful. I hope that was informative. I'm sure I left some things out, so make sure you leave those down in the comments below. Let me know what you think about this MDT mount. I think it's pretty slick. Uh, we're glad to carry it. I think it's a high quality piece of kit that you, know, you can set once, and that is not gonna be a variable down the road. That's what I'm all about, especially when it comes to long range shooting. You know, at the end of the day, firearms are a life-saving device. We wanna make sure that we can set it up and we can rely not only on the equipment itself, but also the accessories. Uh, let me know what you think about these short action customs final scope level. Well, as always folks, while guns and gear is great, what we're really about is training. So make sure you go to paramounttactical.com. Go check out our upcoming training schedule. We'd love to have you out. We'd love to meet you in person. If you can't come see us in person, go check out our Patreon site. I'll put links down below for everything as well as all this stuff. Also, make sure you're buying your gear from us. That really helps us, it helps support the channel. Uh, but on our Patreon site, we do have Virtual Training Academy. Lots of good lessons on there. One hour range sessions that you're basically getting private training from myself or our other instructors. You'll really enjoy that and I think it's more than worth it. It definitely gives you some, it allows you to train efficiently. And make sure you go check out our website. The only gear that we carry on there are items that we have personally tested and we use. So you can buy with confidence on that. But until next time, stay armed, stay ready. We'll talk to you soon.